Hi, I'm Kristen here at UT Southwestern Medical Center, and today we're going to be talking with Dr. Jacob Hunter, who is, an, who is a doctor with our otolaryngology department here at UT Southwestern. We're going to be talking about hearing loss and cochlear implants. So if you have a question, be sure to write it in the comments stream of the live feed. Be sure also to like, love, and share the conversation. That's the most important part. We really want you to share this with your friends and loved ones. And we also want to thank the Collier Center for Communication Disorders for helping us promote this chat. We hope some of you are listening in today. One thing is um, when you're writing in the comments, you know, if you try to be as specific as possible with your question, if you want to say just hey, that's fine too. But otherwise, we're going to get started. So, Dr. Hunter, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now, you're pretty new to UT Southwestern. You've been here for nine months. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Awesome. Well, we're glad you're here. I guess kind of the first question was, like, about how many people deal with hearing loss? Well, I, I think you put it on the, the I think, the webpage, but mm -hmm. we're under the estimation of about 30 to 37 and a half million people in the U.S. have some form of hearing loss. That That's a lot of people. And is is it based, it sounds like it's mainly kind of, at a certain point in life, you're probably gonna have hearing loss, but it doesn't affect just the, the elderly or seniors. Correct, some kids are born with it, uh, mm -hmm. but generally we know that age is a predictor of hearing loss, so you're more likely okay. to have hearing loss as you get older. Okay. We also know men are twice as likely to have hearing loss as compared to women. Do we know why that's the case? Uh, I can't answer that right now, we, I don't know if we do know. <laughs> that's okay. So I know that one of the things that you specialize in is cochlear implants. What's the difference between a hearing aid and a cochlear implant? So a hearing aid is essentially a microphone, if you will. It's picking up the surrounding sound and amplifying it to a patient's ear. So okay. they're still hearing through their natural ability okay. through movement of the eardrum. Okay. The idea behind of a cochlear implant is it's actually bypassing the natural movement of the eardrum and okay. the bones. So it's an electrode that's going into the cochlea okay. uh, that stimulates the nerve directly. Oh, wow. So it is a slightly different sound to what patients are naturally okay. listening. To. Okay, and you have you have one that we could look at. We do. Uh, okay. So uh, this is an example if we're looking at a ear head on. So this okay. is a, a left left ear. Okay. This is actually a cochlear implant. So it's actually attached magnetically to a receiver stimulator underneath the skin. Mm -hmm. uh, and it again with a little hearing aid processor if it, if it looks like that. Okay. And then the receiver stimulator is underneath the skin along the bone and then we don't appreciate it in this model but there's an electrode that goes into this little snail like configuration which is known as the cochlea. Okay. Wow. And so this is something that you can actually take off. Wow. Let me see if I can. It comes off easier in real life. Um, and then uh, usually we recommend that patients take it off at night and then you can apply it back okay. on as needed. Okay. Or in case you don't want to talk to somebody, you can take it off. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know anybody that doesn't ever want to talk to somebody. <laughs> so what type of patient would be a good candidate for a cochlear implant? So the general rule of thumb is thought to be patients uh, who are starting to struggle with their hearing aids. Okay. So we generally start with patients who come in with hearing loss. Uh, depending on the situation, sometimes they're coming in directly to talk about hearing loss. Okay. And they might only qualify for a hearing aid. But then... Okay. If their hearing are such significant loss or they're having problems with hearing aids, we start to explore the role of a cochlear implant for them. Okay, okay, gotcha. So, let's see, so what kind of exams or tests should their doc somebody's doctor do to determine if they have hearing loss? So a, a typical, any otolaryngologist's office uh, okay. will have a basic audiogram, and that's gotcha. looking at your pure tones, the ability mm -hmm. to hear actually something existing, and okay. then we, we assess with a word recognition score. So we provide a simple list of words, and we ask them to repeat that. Okay. And that is a basic battery test that pretty much any mm -hmm. otolaryngologist's office would offer. Okay. Um, that does not tell us whether someone's a cochlear implant candidate, but it gives us an idea whether they might be close or on the cusp of possibly qualifying. Okay. If that's a possibility, uh, we then kind of ramp up the test a little. Testing is okay. about 60 to 90 minutes, and we kind of challenge the patients a little more with, rather than words, with sentences, gotcha. challenging them, and then we assess their percent correct score, if you will. So if they gotcha. do poor enough, depending on the standards we're using, uh, they qualify for an implant. If not, okay. we generally counsel, hey, give it another year or so, and who's to say that they might progress and they might qualify down the road. Okay, so let's say somebody is a candidate for an implant and they receive one. Are they ha how long does it take to do that surgery? And is it very invasive? 
Uh, the surgery takes about two, two to three hours. Okay. Uh, it's a surgery that's a same day procedure. Oh. Um, it is an incision behind. Now let's use this model again. It is an incision behind the ear, okay. uh, reflecting the ear forward, and then we drill a small tunnel uh, through the bone of the ear down into the middle ear to access the cochlea. Okay. And so it provides us a little avenue to place the electrode in the cochlea. Uh, as I said, it takes about two to three hours. Uh, patients are discharged the same day. After the surgery, immediately after the surgery, you do not hear because okay. we do not put on the processor on day one. Okay. We actually have the patient come back about two to three weeks after the fact. Uh, we place the processor on and turn it on. Okay. And patients aren't going to hear naturally from day one. It's going to be a, a work. It's going to be effort. And so generally we recommend that it's going to be about a year before you're going to get the full capabilities of the cochlear implant. Okay. Sometimes it's a little shorter, sometimes it's a little, little longer, and we do expect better outcomes with more highly motivated mm -hmm. patients. Uh, but it does take some work. Right, and so with that work, I mean, what kind of therapy is involved once you have the implant set and maybe, and maybe you have your, the monitoring part of it? So we give patients some exercises to do at home, and the, the best analogy I try to give patients is imagine you're kind of, your ear or your head's kind of a high-performance car engine. Mm -hmm. We are going to have you come back on regular visits a month, three months, six months, and a year. Okay. And we are going to adjust that implant so that you, gotcha. you find out what works for you. What is loud? What is soft? What yeah. sounds work for you? What sounds don't work ah. for you? Okay. And so the more you work at, at home, the, the more the general idea is the better you'll understand what's going right, what's okay. going wrong, and we can adjust accordingly. Occasionally we send some patients out to a kind of auditory rehabilitation specialists yeah. to help improve things, but it is a work in progress to understand what leads to better outcomes right. to compared to not good outcomes. Right. So, so it, it's not a magic solution. You're not going to put it in and all of a sudden you can hear. Unfortunately, everything. not just yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you know we see notice that a lot of you are joining and listening to our chat and watching. So don't forget that to like and share the conversation and also to write the comments in the comments field. So we have a couple coming in. Great. Let's see, Sarah's wondering, are, is there any? risk to getting a cochlear implant? So that's, a, that's a very good question. So like any surgery, there's always risks to surgery. So we always counsel pain, bleeding, and infection. Uh, the reason we have to drill a small tunnel in the bone is because we, we make a small narrow window between the facial nerve, the nerve that helps you move your face, and the nerve that helps you control the taste on that side of the, the tongue. Um, it's a, a risk that I counsel that it's a very, very low risk, less than 1%, uh, but some patients do notice a taste disturbance afterwards, and I have heard reports of some facial weakness after the procedure. Uh, aside from that, maybe a spinal fluid leak, and then the counsel and then recommendation that you might not get the benefit that you'd, you'd want out of the cochlear implant that you thought okay. going in. Okay, so if somebody's not eligible for a cochlear implant, I mean, what are the other options to them? So uh, if you don't qualify, more often than not, you're going to still be utilizing a hearing aid. Okay. Um, there is kind of a middle market of patients who are frustrated with their hearing aids, mm -hmm. who don't qualify for a uh, cochlear implant, which we kind of classify as middle ear implants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We recognize hearing aids are rarely covered by private health, uh, private health right. care plans, as well as Medicare. Uh, but these middle ear implants are kind of a little even higher end than, uh, than okay. hearing aids. We're also trying to expand the boundaries of cochlear implantation. So we're trying to implant patients with more residual hearing before mm -hmm. they even get to the point where they can't hear at all. And okay. so we're trying to encroach upon those patients who might be at the upper limit of hearing aids. And gotcha. so, again, I if you don't qualify, uh, one, we're trying to expand the criteria. Okay. Two, you still might perfectly enjoy a hearing aid. And three, there's those options of middle ear implants that okay. might, 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 might help you out. Okay. All right, so Andy, she's wondering, you know, is the cochlear implant more effective when you're fitted with it at a young age, or does it work the same at any age? It's an interesting question. <laughs> so it kind of depends on the cause of the hearing loss. Unfortunately, there are some people, uh, roughly about two or three births out of a thousand, where kids are born without hearing. Mm -hmm. And so from a childhood perspective, we recognize we want to implant them as early as possible. Uh, ideally, another question that came in. Per, per the FDA criteria, at 12 months of age, uh, we, we can't really implant them. Some people do implant earlier than 12 months, but we try to hit that soft, sweet window in that first year because we recognize kids that are implanted at an early age are able to kind of get more in the mainstream education system. Gotcha. They're able to participate and go to school and do actually perfectly well. Okay. From an older, older individual's perspective, um, if, if the ear that is deaf 
has not been stimulated mm -hmm. for, and we do not know how long, but for, we don't have a right answer, but generally 15, 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. We generally try to avoid implanting that ear because okay. the brain from that ear has not been stimulated. So okay. as long as there's stimulation in that ear and then it gets to the point where the hearing aid isn't working mm -hmm. or you're not enjoying it as much and you do qualify for an implant, we generally implant the poor hearing ear okay. with the understanding that it has been stimulated recently. Okay. Now I know that the you and your team, you guys work closely with the Callier Center for Communication Disorders, who helped promote this chat for us. And this was this is a related question. I mean, how do you evaluate young children for an implant? So, infants, uh, obviously, uh, kids under 12 months of age can't can't respond to sentences, can't respond to words. So, uh, fortunately, in the U.S. and uh, part of our team, Dr. Angela Shoup, who's in charge of audiology here, has has been a big proponent of newborn hearing screening. So mm -hmm. every kid born within the system gets a newborn hearing screen right, right at birth. And it's a fairly basic test that we can run in the hospital, but any kid that fails mm -hmm. uh, is ordered a follow-up in our offices, or really mm -hmm. it's what we call an auditory brainstem response. Right. So we're actually pinging uh, the cochlear nerve to assess its response to make sure it's there, it's mm -hmm. working. And that's a, that's, if I remember correctly, because my children have had it, it's kind of a pitch level where they play various levels of pitches. And They're giving, there's two types of ways. There's clicks and tones, and they put them in the ear, right. and we're assessing essentially the response of that nerve. Mm -hmm. And we actually do that twice to confirm that it actually isn't, it, we're, 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 de we're demonstrating a profound loss. Okay. In addition, we, we do imaging studies. Um, and then as the kids get a little older, there's slightly different tests, understanding we're working mm -hmm. with kids with different abilities to follow commands. Okay, so with that, I mean, you're talking a lot about the different types of cochlear implants and the different types of devices. I mean, what's happening on the technology front for hearing? Are there, is there anything that just came out or something that's coming out on the horizon? Uh, well, from a cochlear implant perspective, we're still, we're still sticking with an electrode in the ear. Okay. Uh, we are trying to understand uh, how we can maintain the hearing in those patients that do have hearing. Okay. So we're, we're using this term hearing preservation yep. to maintain the residual hearing. So we're trying to understand what we can do to reduce that trauma. Mm -hmm. In terms of new technological breakthroughs from the cochlear implant perspective, going back to this processor, uh, a couple companies have now come out with one, one device in and of itself. So oh, rather wow. than have a, a processor that goes behind the ear, as well as the, um, uh, the magnet that attaches the receiver simulator, this is all one unit okay. and just goes over the magnet. Um, there is talk and we technically have the capability of placing an entire implant under the skin. The mm -hmm. question is how do you get sound to that? Um, and then beyond the, the role of a cochlear implant, there are friends of ours that are looking at actually uh, regenerating hair cells, the whole reason why we think oh, people wow. have hear, uh, hearing loss. Uh, birds actually can regenerate hair cells. Humans, unfortunately, can't. And so people are looking at I injecting the viruses to re replenish those hair, hair cells. So, wow. I mean, this is many, many years down the down the road. Uh, but again, looking into okay. looking into those explorations. Well, and you're this came in before, but you're doing research on cochlear implants and hearing loss. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're specifically looking at? So I'm specifically interested in elderly outcomes and cognition. Okay. And so it is well known that hearing loss uh, can lead to social isolation, depression, and actually right. cognitive decline. Uh, we actually know there's a linear relationship with hearing loss and cognitive decline. The greater the hearing loss, the quicker and or more likely you are to lose your ability to like function. Right. And so what we're trying to get started here are projects looking at what we can do to help stimulate uh, or at least take the energy off of listening uh, so that patients can more fo can focus on other parameters. Mm -hmm. And we use that term as listening and effort. So the idea is if, if you can't hear and you're having a difficult time hearing, you're straining all your energy, all your resources to hear. Gotcha. And w we know there's an effect of it decreases patients' short-term and long-term memory. There's mm -hmm. studies that show that you give a hearing aid to a patient with short-term memory, short-term memory performance has improved after giving a hearing aid. So we are interested in cochlear implants. What can we okay. do to possibly, does that expand our candidacy? Do patients with mild cognitive impairment or at risk of mild cognitive impairment, okay. do we try to implant them earlier? These are questions down the road, but these are questions we're, we're interested in looking at. Okay. Well, this gets to that a little bit. So Austin wrote and he said, other than an implant, are there other ways to improve hearing? Um, yeah, that is a good question. Um, aside from, I mean, you're kind of dealt the hand you're dealt with yeah. at birth. 
Um, aside from amplifying it, uh, I am unaware of anything we can possibly do as like, I mean, thinking about going to a gym or exercising or working right. out uh, to improvement. And not to say that there might be studies out there that can, but I am unaware of right. anything to tell a patient to say, hey, this is where you're at, this is where your lines, your, your hearing's gonna improve. I, okay. I unfortunately don't counsel my patients to expect that. Yeah, it was, it was a tough one. So we got another one, our peer, and this is an interesting one. She's wondering, are parent, patients ever worried if they get the cochlear implant that they'll lose their deaf culture, their community with those people? Yes, um, very much so. And we don't really see this in adults, uh, but we definitely see this in children who, mm -hmm. uh, who whether, depending on the family situation, uh, whether the family is familiar with deaf culture or maybe they're the right. only child who doesn't hear, uh, where siblings and the rest of the family do, there is, uh, uh, we, we do recognize that there is a deaf culture who, who they, mm -hmm. we talked about sign language briefly earlier, that mm -hmm. that is an important part of their culture. And so from an adult perspective, not really, not so because we, we realize that those patients who were hearing most of their lives and then unfortunately lost their hearing as they got older, they are becoming socially isolated because they're around their normal culture, which is people mm -hmm. who are interacting and communicating via voice and sound. But we, we do see that in kids and teenagers. Uh, that, is a, that is a balancing act for a lot of families and, and yeah. adolescents. Yeah, I think that would be tricky. So for those, I mean, how do, you, what's a good way to protect your hearing? So, I mean, other than, you know, wearing headphones, are there other ways people things people can do? Uh, I, well, I, and we probably all counsel uh, our patients differently. I generally recommend to my patients, if, you know, if, if you're mm -hmm. listening to a headphones and we are curious about the earbuds, right. if someone can hear that, it's probably too loud. Yeah. Um, we, we do know from federal government regulations, if you work in a loud environment, mm -hmm. uh, there's OSHA standards to protect your ears. Right. So we recommend hearing protection mm -hmm. and that goes for people uh, who might be gun enthusiasts, who might mm -hmm. be uh, loud machine operators, or people who gotcha. are around the racetrack. Again, mm -hmm. trying to maintain uh, ear protection and general good mm -hmm. ear health. I mean, it doesn't really go with uh, hearing per se, but it can lead to hearing loss, but we generally tell patients to not stick anything smaller than their elbow in their ear. Oh. So, wow. being careful. So that gets to the Q-tips. I've heard we're not supposed to use those. Yeah. It's uh, not related to this, but. Yes. Okay. All right, so generally though, you ear protection, for whether you're a gun enthusiast, you work in a loud environment, you're going to a rock concert, and that'll help stave off? The idea is it's protecting the, 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 hair, cell, the hair, hair cells and the hearing, yes. Okay, so kind of a personal question came through. They're wondering, what inspired you to become a doctor that deals with hearing loss? Uh, that is an interesting question. Uh, it sounds like residency and fellowship interviews all over again. <laughs> um, I actually like the finite uh, microscopic surgery and anatomy. Yep. I mean, the, the physiology uh, and the anatomical location is extremely, I mean, it's intellectually stimulating to me. I do appreciate the fact of being able to help patients not only regain their hearing, uh, but as a kind of a basic, not a basic, but doing all sorts of ear surgery and uh, lateral skull-based surgery, being able to help patients out in around the ear is, uh, it gets me excited. And as I said, intellectual stimulation, I, I like the dexterity required for the cases. Right. Uh, I, I enjoy the patients, I enjoy the problems, um, right. and it's it, it what excites me every day. And we're glad to have you here. Well, thanks See, we, got, we got a couple coming through. Okay, this gets back to the Q-tip one. I shouldn't have mentioned that, but <laughs> it's like, how do you clean your ears if you can't use Q-tips? Generally, your ears clean themselves. So uh, for about maybe 5 to 10% of the adult population, wow. I mean, the, the skin and the, the wax come out themselves. And so for those few patients, yes, I understand you might need to go to a an otolaryngologist to get clean, having them wow. cleaned out, but generally they'll they'll clean themselves. So the Q-tip industry doesn't like otolaryngologists <laughs> very much. Okay, we're gonna keep going. Sorry about that. Uh, we've gone from Valerie. She says, "I love live music, and until recently, I've been bad about wearing earplugs at concerts. Is the damage that I've most likely done to my hearing reversible? And can your ears heal if you stop the bad habits?" Um, again, it kind of goes back to our previous, the previous question we answered. I, I mean, it's kind of, you lose the hearing, it's very difficult to get back. We do yeah. understand that there's noise-induced trauma. There are studies in rats and mice that, that if they take a medication before the trauma that they can protect their hearing, but we can't actually 
we're unable to reproduce that in humans in the sense of having someone take a medication that's actually somewhat toxic their entire lives to protect their hearing. Okay. I, I generally tell patients, I mean, you, you, your quality of life is what's most important and you mm -hmm. need to live your life and have fun and enjoy it. And if you love going to live music, great. Uh, just try to maintain general good ear protection and hearing health. And mm -hmm. I mean, hopefully uh, it's enough that you won't lead to problems down the road. That's not to say that the live music would cause a hearing loss and it might be a genetic related issue okay. or just old age as, as one gets older. Okay, this next one I think gets to that. So this one's from Stella. And Stella says, I'm losing my hearing in my right ear and some in my left. I've tried over-the-counter hearing aids. Are those, are they effective? Um, that, that leads into actually a very interesting topic only because we mentioned that hearing aids are not covered by insurance. Okay. So there are two bills that have been forwarded to Congress uh, looking at improving the access to hearing aids. Okay. And there's controversy with that. Uh, a lot of people believe, and maybe this speaks to you, that hearing aids over the counter might not benefit from all, might not benefit mm -hmm. all people. But given the fact that an average hearing aid costs about twenty five hundred dollars, yeah. it, it's going to help people access it more. It's those patients that don't uh, get benefit from the hearing aid. We'd recommend actually an evaluation by mm -hmm. an otolaryngologist and an audiologist because maybe the hearing loss pattern doesn't fit that hearing aid. Now nowadays hearing aids are digital. I mean, okay. there are a bunch of bells and whistles that we can adjust programming, if you will, to, to maybe better help your hearing. I can't guarantee, right. depending on the hearing loss, uh, but for some patients, over-the-counter probably will not work, and they need more specialized care. Okay, so hearing aids are not like reading glasses you can pick them up, and they're a little, it sounds like they're a little bit more individualized. Correct. Based on what your issue is. Correct. Okay, so we've got some more questions coming in. We've got about five minutes. Don't forget to share the conversation. And thanks again to Callier for all of your support. Um, so this is from Sarah. She says, my hearing seems to be more sensitive than my friends and family. Am I at a greater risk of hearing loss as I get older? From what I know, I don't know. I, I well, I don't know. I, I, I'll be honest. I yeah. mean, I, I don't think so. I mean, you, you might, some people have a, uh, a issue, what we call hyperacusis. Uh, mm -hmm. So where it's super sensitivity to sounds. Um, as far as I know, I don't believe that leads to a greater risk of hearing loss. Okay. Um, but again, it, it, uh, it it's like tinnitus or ringing in the ears. I mean, that mm -hmm. can be correlated with mm -hmm. hearing loss. It can also have no relation to hearing loss whatsoever. Okay, okay. So another question, um, and this was one actually that I had that I was wondering, you know, what if you have a cochlear implant or you have a hearing aid, what percentage of sound can you hear through that? Is it like, you? I'm assuming it's not like you would have normal? So a hearing aid uh, amplifies mainly and provides gain in the normal speech frequencies. Okay. Um, and so again, it's only amplifying sound that's already out there using mm -hmm. your natural hearing mechanism. Mm -hmm. From a uh, cochlear implant, it is stimulating the entire nerve uh, from the frequency of 250 hertz all the mm -hmm. way kind of up to up 8,000. We do know it's not the natural sound that you hear with your natural ear. A lot okay. of patients comment that when it gets turned on, patients or people might sound like Donald Duck or Mickey oh. Mouse. And again, that goes back to trying right. to tweak tweak the programming with it afterwards. Mm -hmm. We also know patients don't enjoy music as well. And we're not really sure why exactly. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads to the technological advancements that we're trying to look into. Mm -hmm. What can we do to better simulate natural sound so people can enjoy right. the music, to enjoy kind of the finer qualities of sound that we just can't seem to emulate just yet. But nonetheless, th these have come a long way since they were first introduced. I mean, it was first approved in adults in 84 and kids in 90. I mean, it's come a long way wow, from those that's, initial that's implants. That's not a long time. That's less than 30 years. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing how fast progress goes. All right. So we're going to have we have a couple more minutes. Great. What, what do you tell your patients? What is the most important thing that people should consider when they're thinking about hearing loss? Uh, I mean, I, I, I want my patients to be happy. I want, I mean, from an audiogram perspective, I tell all my patients, listen, I cannot look at your hearing test and tell whether you need a hearing aid or you don't need a hearing aid, whether you need a cochlear implant, whether okay. you don't. And so if you get benefit out of a hearing aid, great. If you feel you don't need one, that's fine by me. If you find you're struggling with a hearing aid, hey, we should explore a cochlear implant. I mean, with the recognition that mm -hmm. there is social isolation, depression, decreased quality of life, I mean, right. most patients recognize they want to get plugged back in. 
And if that means it's a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, I am more than happy to help. My partners, Dr. Uh, Brandon Isaacson, Walter Coots, and Ken Lee, and who are all cochlear implant surgeons here, w would love to help. Um, yeah. But again, we want the patient to be happy, and if they're not ready for it, they're not ready for it. Okay, it's good to know. One more question. We have time for one more question. Sure. This one's from Heather. She says, is hearing loss hereditary at all? It is. It can be. Um, especially from a kid perspective, we'll look at kids and especially ask about a family history. There's a lot of genetic issues with kids. A lot of which we don't know, but chalk up to genetic issues. And then from a from an adult issue, adult perspective, I always ask about a family history. I'm generally asking about the parents. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. if your parents lost a hearing at a similar age to you, more than likely right. it's genetic. Uh, right now, we're just trying to still trying to explore what might be genetic, what might not be genetic, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that might help us better rehabilitate people down the road. Awesome. I think we are out of time, Great. but I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We uh, thanks again to. Callier Center for Communication Disorders. We enjoy this. We're going to be back next week. Next Wednesday, we're going to be talking about burns in advance of the 4th of July, so get ready for that. In the meantime, you know, thank you, Dr. Hunter, for coming and answering all these questions. It's thank really you. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you for coming here, and thank you for everybody for participating.